morning, everybody. I have a great pleasure after 2003, 2007, and, 2000, and today also, of course, to welcome you all in Belgrade at uh, Davis Thompson Foundation meeting. Uh, this time we have more than 90 participants and really outstanding, great speakers. Thank you very much, Professor Mike Carter, for your coming today, and Professor Corey Brown, which is in the other at the moment, in workshop. Thank you, Professor Fabio Cicchiero, and thank you, uh, Professor Ingeborg Lankor, for coming. Uh, I think you will have really success, uh, successful and fruitful work here, and not only that, but also we could initiate a good professional network after this meeting, and we expect this. Thank you, dear Dr. Vladislava Ratz. She helps us very much, uh, also in previous meetings, but today as well. I think we can start with our lectures today uh, until 10 o'clock. This is the time for first coffee break. Professor Michael Garner, please. Thank you. Colonies. 
colonies that will ensure that these species do not go extinct. Hopefully, someday, uh, with the aim that they can be reintroduced to natural habitat uh, and be self-sustaining in the wild. Some of these programs have already been successful. Some have not been successful. And uh, part of that reason is because we have uh, disease problems in some of these assurance colonies. And uh, this has been a, a, a major interest of mine uh, throughout my career. <coughs> We have a large archive of non-domestic felids, and the emphasis of this talk is on uh, the retrospective study that we performed this year regarding the prevalence of neoplasia in the various species of felids that have been submitted to our facility from institutions in the United States. Note that we have uh, we had 1,781 felid submissions, and that uh, that represented 20 different species of non-domestic cats. The data that I present today are based on histologic diagnosis, sometimes augmented with immunohistochemistry. Uh, anything that. Uh, was coded as a cyst or hyperplasia, uh, was not included in the study. Those cases in which the same animal was submitted twice, either you know, as a biopsy initially and as a necropsy thereafter, was included as only one case. The prevalence uh, at our facility of neoplasia in the cats that were submitted Granted, this is a relative prevalence in a skewed population of animals, but prevalence was approximately 23%. And 5% prevalence of neoplasia regarding more than one neoplasm uh, in that submission. By species, uh, the highest prevalence of neoplasia was, was in the uh, lions, jaguars, cougars, lynx, and tiger. <clears throat> Remarkably, for the numbers that we had, uh, it was interesting that cheetahs, which are genetic monsters, <laughs> They have all kinds of different diseases. Actually, have a relatively low prevalence of neoplasia. By system, endocrine systems uh, were most frequently represented for neoplastic processes. Pretty much across the board in most of the species, followed by skin and hematopoietic systems. Uh, the remaining systems below average. So now I will, I will uh, discuss the prevalence of these uh, neoplastic processes by species and with a few comments about the morphology of the lesions, uh, the gross and histologic appearance of the lesions. So uh, African lions uh, are considered vulnerable by the IUCN. Uh, and we had uh, 202 lions from 40 different facilities in, in, the, in the study. The uh, sex distribution was approximately equal. And they had a high prevalence of more than one neoplasm per annum. And the average age at the time of submission, 17 years, lions can live 
up to approximately 30 years, but most of them start to fizzle out in their early 20s. Of the hematopoietic tumors, all of them were lymphoid malignancies. In the endocrine system, uh, interestingly, there were several adrenal cortical tumors, which is uncommon, generally speaking, in the feelings. And we had a few other species that had uh, a higher than average prevalence of adrenal cortical tumors. Uh, a lot of biliary tumors, uh, primarily benign, similar to the biliary tumors that you see in domestic cats. And then uh, a high prevalence of pulmonary tumors, uh, including malignant pulmonary tumors, uh, bronchoalveolar adenocarcinomas. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, Lions had a, a, a somewhat high prevalence of mesotheliomas, and we will see this trend throughout our presentation in various species of felids. It appears that zoo felids have a high prevalence of mesothelioma, and the reason for this uh, predisposition I don't think is known. And I, I doubt very seriously that it has anything to do with asbestos, which is a uh, cause of mesotheliomas, uh, generally the cause of mesotheliomas in humans. Uh, skin tumors, they included benign basal cell tumors and lacomas, etc. Uh, pretty much uh, uninteresting. And uh, we did have uh, a fairly high prevalence in the lions of intestinal adenocarcinomas. The lions also had a high prevalence of soft tissue sarcomas in the skin. Uh, these, uh, these tumors were oftentimes not further characterized by probably fibrosarcomas, nerve sheet tumors, smooth muscle tumors, etc. Uh, these uh, pulmonary tumors in most of the species are common, uh, and most were benign, except in the lion. The lion had a higher prevalence of malignant pulmonary tumors than did the other cats. They uh, present oftentimes multicentric in the lung. And I, I just wanted to, to point out uh, briefly uh, that uh, the multicentric distribution of pulmonary tumors is common. It's common uh, in many species, including domestic species and the domestic cats and dogs. And this can be problematic, especially for clinicians, because uh, what they do is take a radiograph. Uh, of the lungs when, the, when an animal presents with a mammary tumor or some other tumor, uh, 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 looking for metastatic lesions. And clinicians see these, this distribution of masses in the lung, uh, thinking that these are metastatic foci of a mammary gland adenocarcinoma, and in fact, uh, they may just be benign bronchoalveolar adenomas a tumor that can be multicentric within the lungs. Does everybody understand what I mean? You clinicians understand. That's important because uh, the next inclination is to put the animal down because it's got metastatic tumor. My recommendation in that regard is that you be conservative about the interpretation of masses that are in the lung. Wait till the animal gets sick before you put them down because those might be benign lesions. Uh, the pulmonary, ad, uh, pulmonary bronchogenic ad, uh, adenomas uh, very well differentiated and generally follow the pattern of the uh, alveoli, whereas the malignant neoplasms uh, uh, had less differentiation, did not have uh, alveolar uh, morphologic patterns, and were invasive. Lymphoma is a multicentric neoplastic process. There is no such thing as a benign lymphoma. There is no such thing as a single focus of lymphoma. Lymphoma is a multicentric tumor that develops spontaneously in various tissues. So, if you have 
a lymph node with a lymph node malignancy, and it, it is most likely that you have lymphoma in other tissues as well, other nodes, uh, organs, skin, oral mucous membranes, etc. Whether you can see it or not, there is no such thing as a benign lymphoma. It, in the uh, in the cats, generally these tumors were blast cell tumors that uh, developed rapidly and, uh, and and progressed rapidly. Sometimes there would be concurrent uh, leukemia in some of these animals, but generally speaking, not. Cytology can be helpful in the diagnosis of lymphoma, but you have to be careful about diagnosing lymphoma cytologically, uh, especially if you're aspirating tissues like the spleen, where there is a, a great deal of hematopoiesis and uh, even uh, some uh, lymphoblastic proliferation <coughs> in the white pulp. So if you aspirate that portion, it's going to look like a tumor. Mesotheliomas are tumors of mesothelial cells that arise on the serosal surfaces of the viscera. Both the pleural and the uh, abdominal serosal surfaces. These tumors, generally speaking, are rare with the exception of humans and zoo cats. Why they develop in zoo cats, we don't understand. These are aggressive malignancies. Uh, they are associated with cavitary effusions. And uh, the, uh, the initial examination will include aspiration of the effusion by the clinician. And there will be uh, atypical cells in the effusion. These, uh, uh, these may or may not be uh, indicative of mesothelioma, though. Cavitary effusions, in general, will stimulate mesothelial cells to become hypertrophied uh, and uh, hyperplastic and to exfoliate into the cavities. And these activated mesothelial cells can be difficult to distinguish from uh, true neoplastic mesothelial cells. So again, the interpretation has to be conservative. However, in working with the zoo cats and with the knowledge of the propensity for the development of mesothelioma, there should then be a high suspicion uh, that there is a malignancy present. The problem is that zoo cats are examined once a year. It's considered a routine physical examination. And it, it, it requires a, a great deal of vigilance by the zoo veterinarians to examine these animals. First, they have to be anesthetized. And, well, first they have to be constrained to where they can be anesthetized. And, uh, and then they, they have to be uh, monitored while they're anesthetized and while they do all of the routine physical examination. And this takes a fairly long period of time, an hour or two per cat. And unfortunately, by the time they determine that the animal has something wrong with it, it's possible that that mesothelioma or other neoplasm may have been present for six to eight months or ten months and was well advanced. Uh, smooth muscle tumors. Lyomyoma and lyomyosarcoma. Uh, these, these generally are benign tumors uh, that occur in the reproductive tract of females. Uh, sometimes we get them in the, the intestinal tract or in the skin, probably arising from the rectopili muscles of the adnexa or the blood vessels. Uh, most are benign. When they're in the reproductive tract, they can achieve large size and ulcerate, and the animals present with blood from the bowl. Uh, and this, of course, can be problematic and uh, something that can be visualized by keepers, uh, curators, or veterinarians. 
Subsequently, uh, they are brought back in and get an anesthetized, uh, and, uh, and, a, and surgical procedures are performed to determine where the blood's gone. Usually, the tumors are benign, so that's a good thing. An ovarian hysterectomy is cured. However, large tumors can displace the viscera and, and, can, and can cause uh, venous hypotension, hypotension as a result of uh, compression on the caudal vena cava. And these animals can uh, become hypotensive and, and actually can, uh, can develop uh, induction abnormalities or not. What was that? Picture? No. Everything is going okay out here? <laughs> uh, you got the cameras on? And, all right. The malignant tumors, uh, mild and mild generally are slow to metastasize. And that is also uh, uh, helpful to the veterinarians uh, because uh, uh, even the malignancies uh, can be cured oftentimes by surgical decision. Uh, soft tissue sarcomas in the skin and the vertebral connective tissues are pretty common in, in the lions. And even, uh, even histologically, they can be difficult to distinguish uh, as far as the cell of origin. Um, when you, when, of course, they're going to aspirate these before they do anything else and, and see what they look like cytologically. And cytologically, uh, they don't exfoliate particularly well in most cases. But if, if you're lucky, you'll get uh, some spindle cells uh, that uh, indicate that it's at least a tumor of mesenchymal origin. And if the tumor cells are fairly bland, as in this case, with minimal anisocaryosis and small nucleoli no mycoses, then it more than likely is a low-grade tumor, low-grade viral sarcoma or uh, uh, nerve sheet tumor. <coughs> However, all of these tumors tend to be invasive and difficult to completely excise. So if they're, if they're diagnosed in a relatively late stage of development, then they might be in, in, in a... Uh, uh, you may not be able to completely excise them. A, a tumor like this one, that, that's going to be very difficult to completely excise. And it's going to be problematic for, for uh, for the zoo veterinarians because they can only get their hands on these animals uh, at opportune times. And to, to have to completely uh, or, or, or to anesthetize the animal frequently and do multiple surgical excisions on this animal is going to be problematic. So more, more often than not, once this thing becomes problematic and quality of life, this compromise, I'll have to put this animal down. Cougars are uh, endemic to North and South America. Uh, they are uh, of least concern by the IUCN. We had uh, 142 of these cougars from 22 facilities. Interestingly enough, uh, Yesterday, one of these cats killed a bicyclist uh, in Washington State, where I'm from. It was a skinny cat, and uh, probably uh, uh, did not adapt well in the wild to capturing its own food and preyed on a, a bicyclist. It was subsequently tracked down by dogs and killed, and now it's being examined to see if it had anything like, you know, rabies or, or some other problem that would have predis predisposed it to abnormal behavior. But the real reason why we're having problems with cougars is because our population is expanding into the, into the territory of the cougar. And, and subsequently, there are conflicts between humans and cougars in, the, uh, in North America. So uh, the cougars have a... Uh, a, a pretty even gender distribution as well. Um, higher than an average uh, number of animals that have more than one tumor. And uh, somewhat low average age for tumor development in general. 
Again, uh, the cougars have a higher prevalence of lymphoma, uh, very high prevalence of endocrine tumors. The, those being uh, thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal. They had a high prevalence of biliary tumors, uh, and uh, some of these were malignant. I might, I, I might add at this point that the uh, hypocellular tumors uh, are uh, uncommon in zoo fields. And they're, they're fairly uncommon in captive, uh, I mean in domestic cats as well. Primarily biliary tumors in the zoo fields rather than hypocellular tumors. And then uh, we had uh, five cases of uh, mammary gland malignancies uh, in, the, uh, in the cougars. Uh, we, it, many of the different species have uh, mammary tumors. Why do you think we might have a, a high prevalence of mammary neoplasia in the zoo fields? Say, say again. They can't pay, so they have persistent hormonal stimulation in an abnormal after cycle. Uh, that's probably one reason. Any other? Use of hormones. Sorry? Use of hormones. Use of hormones for what? For suppressing the hormones. Contraception, right? Yeah. Yes, we usually use one uh, called an esterol acetate that uh, resulted in a high prevalence of uh, mammary gland malignancies. We use a different one now, lupronide. That, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is better, or appears to be better. Uh, we'll see, time will tell. But uh, for now, uh, the, the, the contraceptive that was being used, it was a, it was a in, uh, uh, intermittent contraceptive so that we could withdraw it and breed these animals at a later date when uh, the stud book uh, indicated that it was optimal for breeding. Sorry. Yes. Have you seen uh, cases of mammary fibroepithelial hyperplasia? The same condition in the cats. You know, that's. Um, have you seen that? Uh, one more time. Uh, have you seen the uh, the condition that is, you know, relatively common in cats? Uh, mammary fibroepithelial fibroepithelial hyperplasia mm -hmm. uh, in the domestic cats. Yeah. Yes, we we did we did see this. Uh, uh, you know, there, there was a Ovaban was the name of the drug that would do it in the domestic cat. And we do see this from time to time in the non-domestic species. I didn't include them in the study because it's a hyperplastic change. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, it, a lot of the mammary malignancies that we would see in the domestic, in, in the zoo fields would be associated with concurrent mammary gland lobular hyperplasia, which is a little different than fibroepithelial hyperplasia. Uh, but uh, there would be uh, hyperplasia juxtaposed with areas of, of neoplasia, uh, which is also common in domestic species, <coughs> in dogs, and you know, would suggest that there was hormonal stimulation that was that was contributing to the development of hyperplasia and eventual uh, transformation to neoplasia. So, uh, thyroid tumors were common in the zoo fields. Um, most of them were benign, except in the cougar. Uh, and oftentimes the tumors would be bilateral. Uh, my guess would be that uh, all of these endocrine tumors are underrepresented in this study, probably underdiagnosed because of their location, because of the circumstances in which the necropsy was performed. Uh, Oftentimes, you know, these zoo veterinarians that are doing the necropsy uh, are very, they're very busy for one thing. Like all, like all veterinary clinicians, very busy. And the, the necropsies wait until the evening time. Uh, these are big animals, sometimes they're obese, and it's difficult to find the endocrine tissues. Uh, the thyroids, the, the adrenals, uh, pancreas. These things can sometimes be difficult to identify and uh, subsequently are not collected. So I think that there are times when these, uh, these animals have these neoplastic processes, uh, but they are missing during the necropsy procedure and thus don't get documented. Because endocrine tumors are notorious for paraneoplastic syndromes, in other words, uh, functional neoplasms that cause uh, 
uh, and within our metabolic arrangement. Um, I think that it is likely that peritoneoplastic syndromes in these zoophilas are also <coughs> underdiagnosed because the animals are only being examined once a year. And it is difficult to determine, you know, without blood work and urinalysis, uh, if, if there are peritoneoplastic syndromes occurring in these animals. Endocrine tumors, uh, thyroid tumors can be uh, cystic, they can be solid, uh, as in this image, uh, histologic image, and uh, even though well differentiated, they can, they can have a uh, they, they can have a fair degree of cellular anaplasia and mitotic figures and infiltrate right through the capsule and metastasize to uh, regional lymph nodes and lung. Parathyroid tumors, similar grossly to thyroid tumors. In fact, I don't think you can uh, reliably be differentiated grossly from thyroid tumors and uh, oftentimes also can be unilateral or bilateral. Uh, these, this one here uh, is a parathyroid tumor, and then uh, we have a thyroid tumor in the contralateral gland. As with domestic cats, uh, actual neoplastic parathyroid tissue or thyroid tissue can be difficult to distinguish from hyperplastic tissue. Animals that have uh, concurrent renal disease uh, can have uh, uh, bilateral parathyroid hyperplasia, so-called renal secondary hyperparathyroidism, which causes the parathyroid glands to become hypertrophy and hyperplastic. Uh, cystic biliary tumors are the most common hepatic neoplasms. Uh, usually they were benign and incidental, uh, but even when they're benign, they get quite large sometimes and they can rupture. And when they rupture, then the animals develop uh, uh, peritonitis. The malignant tumors, malignant biliary tumors are aggressive malignancies that invade the hepatic parenchyma. Uh, get into the va uh, vascular system and metastasize. They can also be associated with carcinomatosis, uh, the development of neoplastic cells on the cerebral surfaces of the viscera. Even uh, well differentiated biliary tumors uh, 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 can be invasive. This, this, uh, this malignancy is infiltrating the adjacent hepatic parenchyma. Uh, a higher magnification showing this tumor uh, invading the parenchyma of the liver. This is a skier's response around the tumor, and these are emboli of the neoplasm within lymphatic channels uh, in the liver. And if there were uh, a biopsy obtained of this tumor at this time, and and that uh, that focus of tumor embolus in the lymphatic channel was present, then. Pathologists will know that it is most likely that this tumor has already metastasized. Very important information for the zoo veterinarian. So, as I mentioned earlier, adrenal cortical tumors seem to be common in zoo fields and possibly underreported. When you do a necropsy, regardless of the species, and you uh, Lay open your skin flap and, and abdominal wall flap. Just look at things for a minute. Don't do anything. Just look. Uh, because if you just look at it for a minute, you may see things that you wouldn't initially identify before getting your hands in there and moving the gut around and so forth. And then, very carefully go after the adrenal glands before you do anything else. Go to the adrenals. Uh, they're right in front of the kidney on both sides. And be sure to get both of them. I think this is a problem uh, for the clinicians. When they're busy, in a hurry, uh, or a technician is doing the necropsy. 
We saw benign and malignant variants of the adrenal tumors. Uh, and these tumors can also achieve large size, uh, sometimes can even be palpated um, without uh, doing any kind of exploratory surgery. And as with the, the other endocrine tumors, the, the perineoplastic syndromes that often are seen with, with uh, adrenal tumors in domestic species are not well characterized in the zoo fields. But I suspect they occur and that we're just missing them. Tigers are the largest of the zoo cats, and there are two subspecies. Uh, it is, their, their designations have been very confusing throughout the decades as to which subspecies there are. But now they have, the, they have uh, combined the two subspecies, the island subspecies and the, uh, and the mainland subspecies. Uh, tigers, tigers, and tigers, someday. Regardless of the subspecies, they are all endangered or critically endangered cats. So we had a lot of them. 78 submitting facilities uh, on the tigers. The Bengal tiger, one of the land tigers, uh, had the highest prevalence of neoplasia. And they also had a, a higher than average, a much higher than average prevalence of more than one neoplastic process. Females were overrepresented uh, for neoplasia in the tigers, uh, and their average age at the time of neoplasia just a little bit low. Um, why would the females be overrepresented uh, for the tiger? Uh, and 
the eyelid cells have a little cellular hemiplegia. And the soft tissue sarcomas that we saw in these cats, uh, uh, typical fibrosarcomas and vascular neoplasms, uh, the hemangiosarcoma in the, uh, in the zoo felids is similar to the hemangiosarcomas that occur in the domestic cat. Uh, uh, in other words, they are uh, clearly malignant, uh, oftentimes involved the skin, uh, but are slower to metastasize than, say, the hemangiosarcomas that we see in the domestic dogs or in the wolves or other non-domestic canids. Uh, they are not these aggressive anaplastic malignancies that develop in the spleen, uh, the base of the heart. Uh, they do not uh, metastasize to distant sites readily. Uh, as we had discussed before, mammary tumors, very common in the zoo felids due to con contraception. Uh, their behavior, regardless of whether the uh, tumor was associated with contraceptives or just occurred spontaneously in an older cat, was similar. Uh, they are aggressive malignancies. They can be diagnosed by cytology. Uh, but you have to be careful. Uh, in cytologic preparations, uh, for you clinicians, uh, it, it, clearly if you get clusters of cells that have uh, anaplasia, in other words, anisokaryosis, different sizes of the nuclei, intensely blue cytoplasm, mitotic figures, and so forth, great. You've got the diagnosis. But, in actuality, there is a low correlation in, in uh, the diagnosis between the diagnosis of mammary malignancies cytologically versus histologically because these tumors often are cystic and sometimes are inflamed or are associated with a skewish response. So it's, when you aspirate them, sometimes you're aspirating the cystic portion or the inflamed portion and you may not have neoplastic cells in the aspirate. Thus, you think uh, from the cytologic preparation that you have a uh, focus of uh, mastitis or mammary gland cyst and uh, proceed accordingly in the wrong direction with the treatment. So cytology can be uh, helpful, but it also can be misleading. Biopsies are much more sensitive if you can do them. Uh, this, is one, this is one of these mammary gland animal carcinomas in one of these cats. Uh, this is the tumor. Uh, this is a well-differentiated tumor in this case. However, even though it was well-differentiated, this tumor had metastasized to the liver. <coughs> so we'll move on to the leopard. There are several different uh, subspecies of the leopard all of which are considered vulnerable. We had a, a large number of these cats submitted from a large number of submitting facilities, um, and they had an average prevalence of tumors based on the overall study. The, the two subspecies with uh, the most interesting neoplastic presentations were the snow leopards and the clouded leopards. The clouded leopards have, have a, an especially high prevalence of tumors. And uh, we had uh, a particularly high prevalence of uh, uh, more than one tumor in these cats. Interestingly, we had two meningiomas in the leopards. We can see this. Uh, I think we had one meningioma someplace else, but the leopards in general, we had two meningiomas, which are not common you know, in, in, uh, in, in yeah. Uh, High prevalence of lymphoma is to be expected. Uh, a high prevalence of uh, endocrine neoplasia. We had more field chromocytomas uh, in, in the leopards than we did in the other species. These are, this is the uh, tumors of the uh, of the endocrine of the uh, medullary portion of the adrenal gland. Uh, a lot of parathyroid tumors and a lot of uh, thyroid tumors in these animals. <coughs> Note that we had a, uh, in, 
in these cats, we had a high prevalence of oral squamous cell carcinomas. And this is all in the snow level. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Also, we had uh, some testicular tumors in the leopards that we didn't see in the other cats. And then in the skin, squamous cell carcinomas again. And this is all in the snow leopard. And then uh, a high prevalence again in the leopards for mesotheliomas. So I want to talk about the snow leopards for a minute. Uh, this is a, a the population of snow leopards has been bottlenecked. There's not a lot of genetic diversity. There is a stud book, an international stud book, uh, that is being used to optimize genetic diversity in the breeding of the snow leopard. However, we see a lot of different odd developmental anomalies and, uh, and neoplastic processes, infectious <coughs> processes in the snow leopard that would be considered opportunistic in other species. But the snow leopard has a very high prevalence of viral papillomas caused by papillomavirus, uh, primarily involving the, the tongue, but also involving the skin. And although we see papillomas in other zoo feelings, especially in the mouth, uh, they usually will spontaneously regress like they do in other species. However, in the snow leopard, uh, these, these uh, these lesions appear to have some potential for transformation to squamous cell carcinoma. And that's why we see this high prevalence of squamous cell carcinoma in the oral cavity of snow leopards and in the skin of snow leopards. And, then, and subsequently the skewed population of squamous cell carcinoma in the leopard group. Once these, once these little tiny papillomas transform, uh, then, then we get a, a, a very serious manifestation of the oral cavity, just like the squamous cell carcinomas in domestic cats. Uh, be anywhere in the oral cavity, oftentimes are in the uh, underneath the tongue in the frenulum region, invasive malignancies, uh, slow to metastasize, but quite disfigured. This is uh, one of these tumors that uh, occurred in the frenulum, and uh, of course, uh, because they can only examine these cats annually, uh, these things can be quite advanced by the time that they're identified and cannot be surgically excised. The squamous cell tumors are uh, usually well differentiated malignancies arising from the mucosa, uh, invasive, uh, in invoke a scarce response, usually are quite inflamed, sometimes ulcerated. So, in the, in the cytology, again, uh, for you clinicians. Uh, you can't diagnose squamous cell carcinoma cytologically, but you have to be careful again. Sure, if you get atypical cells with large nuclei and uh, large nucleoli or binucleated cells, more than likely it is a squamous cell carcinoma. But because they're inflamed and ulcerated, there's a skewish response, sometimes all you'll get is, uh, is macrophages or blood or neutrophils or uh, fibroblasts and can misdiagnose it as an inflammatory lesion and subsequently uh, go in the wrong direction with treatment. Squamous cell carcinomas can be very deceiving cytologically. In the snow leopard, uh, the papillomas were very characteristic. Uh, Papilliform proliferations of well differentiated squamous epithelium, uh, even with some hyperkeratosis, uh, uh, but also had these nice coilocytes in the granular layer, uh, characteristic of papillomavirus infection. But the tumors within, uh, the papillomas within uh, develop some. Uh, dysplasia or atypia and then eventually transform and at least we were very interested in these lesions whether or not there, there had been any viral uh, 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 presence in those areas of transformation. So uh, we did immunohistochemistry and we were able to, de to determine that even in the tumors there were areas of uh, viral antigen. 
I'm sorry. Say again. Which antibodies did we use for the virus? Well, I didn't do it, uh, but uh, the antibodies would be against the. We did, we looked for papilloma virus and we looked for herpes virus. Uh, now, how the antibodies were developed, uh, I don't know. There are, there are polychromal and monoclonal antibodies for papilloma virus means for chemistry. Generally, people use the polychromal because you use them to to detect uh, the virus in multiple species. Mm -hmm. We don't use very frequently because we know that, uh, you know, diagnostic doesn't have a lot of meaning, only useful publication, mm -hmm. and then you can do inside of realization. And then another thing you can do these days, which is great, and uh, you can shave, uh, or you can target cells from the paraffin block. You can pretty much uh, uh, do PCR for a generic papilloma virus uh, presence, or even go specifically to the, the various types. But Jim is done for publication. Did everybody understand what Fabio said? Nowadays, uh, we don't really use the immunohistochemistry chemistry very much. It's useful to determine if there is antigen in, in the lesion. But what we would do nowadays, uh, in addition to this for publication or even for diagnostic purposes, is using tissue shaped from the paraffin block uh, do PCR to determine whether or not there's any DNA uh, in the block. The only, the, the only limitation to that is that it doesn't determine whether or not the DNA is actually in the lesion. It could be elsewhere in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the tissue or in another tissue that is in the block. So there are limitations to both procedures, uh, but uh, that, that is available. Fortunately, uh, viral papillomas usually have uh, histologic uh, uh, appearance that is diagnostic and uh, we don't have to do any ancillary work. Fetal chromocytomas are uh, tumors of the medullary region of the adrenal gland. Again, I think that we have underrepresented these in the study because they may not have been collected in necropsy. Uh, this has been a problem. Uh, and, and many of our studies of uh, endocrine tumors and other species as well. Uh, these tumors generally are dark, grossly dark tumors, uh, dark and can be solid or cystic depending on how fast they are growing to cystic ones outgrow their blood supply and develop hemorrhage and so forth. Uh, but generally they are well differentiated tumors and uh, have, a, have characteristic features of chromatin cells. They are uh, uh, heavily granulated cytoplasm. And in this particular case, the tumor uh, is infiltrating the cortex here, uh, characteristic uh, 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 malignancy, but we actually did not see metastatic uh, foci. Uh, seven of us are uh, uh, generally low-grade malignancies. They, the uh, tumors can be diagnosed cytologically. Uh, again, I have some, uh, some uh, comments regarding the cytologic diagnosis of a seven of them. They're round cell tumors, just like lymphoid malignancies. And the distinct and distinguishing them from a lymphoid malignancy cytologically can be problematic. Of course, if you're aspirating a, uh, a swollen testicle and, and you have uh, these cells, uh, these, uh, these round cells that have a, uh, a, uh, a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, in other words, a large nuclei with scan cytoplasm and uh, mitotic figures are present and so forth, then you know it's a seminal. However, if that seminoma is metastasized to the sublumbar lymph node and you're aspirating the lymph node, uh, you, you might mistake this for a lymphoid malignancy. Uh, histologically, we have no troubles with seminomas. They're well differentiated tumors. They usually uh, recapitulate the morphologic features of the seminiferous tube. Uh, the uterine smooth muscle tumors. Uh, <laughs> Oftentimes, there's very well differentiated neoplasms. So, 
and just present as a nodule proliferation, so well differentiated the pain plastic smooth muscle, and, uh, and can be uh, completely inconsequential when they're small. Uh, they get larger, though, as we had mentioned. Uh, they can be problematic uh, just due to uh, being a large space occupying mass that displaces the viscera, or they can ulcerate, uh, become necrotic, or infect. The lateral mouse sarcomas, uh, again, um, usually are well differentiated malignancies, but with some degree of cellular anaplasia, but they're kind of slow to metastasize. They can be a little difficult to completely excise, too, depending on where they are. Well, this tumor uh, wedged here between the uh, rostral aspect of the midbrain uh, and compressing the, uh, the uh, cerebral cortex is going to be <laughs> problematic because, uh, you know, this cat's going to have central nervous system signs. Well differentiated uh, tumors. Uh, Spindle cells that form what's called the nemophiliomatous worlds and uh, generally non invasive. And these, these actually, in domestic species, haven't been successfully removed surgically. It's going to be a problem, though, in, in a zoo cat, and they would be put down. Cheetahs. Uh, primarily African, there is a small population of cheetahs that still exist in Iran. Uh, they are considered vulnerable, uh, but they did go through a bottleneck and have uh, some problems with genetic diversity. So the stud book, uh, the international stud book is very careful about how these animals are bred in order to optimize genetic diversity. We have a lot of cheetahs. Uh, from several facilities. Uh, they have a, a high prevalence, or rather, uh, a, a, a lower than average prevalence of neoplasia and uh, a, a, a lower than average uh, occurrence of more than one neoplasm in, in, uh, per cat. Average age at the diagnosis was 10 years. Um, that's a little bit low as well for the, for the lifespan of the cheetahs, uh, but the gender distribution was, a, was approximately equal. They have their own set of tumors, cheetahs. In addition to the usual endocrine tumors, uh, cheetahs develop myeloid-like homos. This is a tumor of adipose tissue and hematopoietic elements. Generally, the hematopoietic elements are represented all cell lines and with orderly maturation. These tumors are multi-centered in the spleen. And occasionally, we'll see some in the liver or in the adrenal gland. But generally, it is a splenic neoplasm in the cheetah. And they are exceptionally common, uh, recognized early uh, in, the, uh, in the pathology world and, and uh, the examination of cheetahs from zoos. And they're important because of, the, because of their gross presentation. Cheetahs also had the mast cell tumors. Mast cell neoplasia was otherwise uncommon in the zoo felix, uh, but the cheetahs got them. And these are well differentiated mast cell tumors that are identical to those mast cell tumors that we see in the domestic cat, also in the uh, domestic ferret. The myelolacomas present as multiple, sometimes coalescing masses of um, white nodular tissue. The presence of cut surface and the histologic appearance. Well differentiated adipocytes or fat cells and uh, clusters of hematopoietic tissue representing all cell types. Completely benign in the cheetah, even though they're multicentric in the spleen. However, if you're not familiar with the clinical, with the gross presentation of these myelolacomas, then uh, at necropsy, 
If you open them up and you see a spleen like that, you're thinking either malignancy or some form of severe granulomatous disease, such as a uh, tuberculosis, mycobacteriosis, or a fungal infection. But in fact, that's completely benign for these cats. The mast cell tumors in, the, in these cats present just like they do in um, domestic cats, solitary or multicentric in the skin, slightly <coughs> raised, and smooth plaques, usually hairless, and uh, minimally invasive. Uh, some pathologists feel that these mast cell tumors are benign. Uh, and some pathologists, like myself, feel that they are malignancies uh, that are slow to involve internal viscera or regional lymph nodes. Generally, uh, they're round, uh, slightly ovoid sometimes, have a very faint cytoplasmic granularity, unlike uh, domestic dogs, which generally have prominent cytoplasmic granules. And uh, uh, generally, they have a low degree of uh, cellular anaplasia, uh, mild anisal periosis, small nucleoli, uh, very low lymphotic index. Uh, sometimes will uh, recruit eosinophils, uh, just like the other uh, species with mast cell neoplasia. Histologically, uh, a slightly raised plaque like appearance of the tumors, uh, very similar to the domestic cat. And, and again, uh, uh, loosely aggregated sheets or strings of brown cells, faint cytoplasmic granularity, and sometimes uh, with some edema and a few eosinophils. Jaguars are indigenous to the uh, South American countries, Mexico, and a small population exists. Uh, in uh, the southwestern United States. They are considered near threatened. This, I think, is going to change very soon to uh, threatened species because uh, their, their numbers are declining due to the loss of habitat, poaching, and, uh, and honey. Uh, capture for the, the pet trade, believe it or not. So that these cats have uh, a higher than average prevalence of neoplasia uh, and uh, a somewhat low average age, but a equal uh, gender distribution. There were parathyroid tumors predominantly, uh, and, and, you know, another cat with endocrine tumors. Uh, mammary tumors overrepresented, ovarian tumors overrepresented in these cats. Again, this, this is all because primarily of uh, 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 contraception. We also have mesothelioma in one of these cats. The ovarian tumors developed in the post reproductive cats uh, and, good, and some of them were bilateral. Interestingly enough, um, Although concurrent family had adenocarcinoma was seen in some of these cats, there, uh, there was some indication recently that the ovarian tumors were not always associated with the, with the medgastinol acetate implants, and that there might have been a, a germline mutation in the, in the leopards that is predisposing them to the development of ovarian adenocarcinoma. The bobcat uh, is, a, is another North American species. Uh, they are at least concerned, but their population numbers are declining as well due to loss of habitat and hunting. Uh, they had a higher than average prevalence of neoplasia, and it was mostly in Is a, a northern species uh, in the United States, but there is a there is a European lynx that is not, uh, critically endangered as well. And they had a higher than average prevalence of more than one neoplastic process, uh, but uh, there was no 
there was no particular trends in, in, those, in those cats. Uh, Caracals, uh, we had uh, not too many of these cats submitted, and I believe we had no trends in tumor development in the caracals. Circles, uh, we had only two mammary gland adenocarcinomas. Again, not much to speak of. We, didn't, we, we had uh, not enough, really, of these cats submitted. Uh, I think uh, the same with the ocelot. Uh, palace cat, one of my favorite cats. I mean, yeah, how could you not like a cat like that? They also had uh, uh, no, no, no trends in neoplastic development. Fishing cats, on the other hand, uh, interestingly had a high prevalence of transitional cell carcinomas. And we don't understand you know, why a fishing cat of all these other species would have a high prevalence of transitional cell carcinomas. There is a manuscript in preparation at this time regarding this tumor in the fishing cat. To my knowledge, the pathogenesis is not understood. Are, yes? Urinary bladder, right? No, transitional cell carcinomas of the urinary bladder. Yeah. Uh, primarily arising at the trigone. It's possible that uh, may be related to some compounds in the fish since these animals are um, they are primarily a fish-eating cat, so uh, Fabio suggests that perhaps there is some kind of a compound in the, in the fish that they're eating that might be uh, carcinogenic. You know, perhaps some fish are accumulating biotoxins uh, in the environment. Uh, that's a pretty hot topic in and of itself, especially as it pertains to marine animals and to uh, uh, human ingestion of contaminated fish. And, and perhaps this is true. These tumors generally arise at the trigone. That's, that's that portion of the urinary bladder that the ureters feed into and the ureter exits from. And of course, when these tumors uh, get large enough, they will occlude the, the urethra and ureters, and subsequently the bladder will get distended. The cats will develop uh, uh, hydronephrosis sometimes if they live long enough. Uh, but most importantly, these tumors are very aggressive malignancies, readily metastasized to regional lymph nodes and abdominal viscera. This is a urinary, the wall of the urinary bladder, uh, one of these tumors arising from the mucosa. It has both exophytic, in other words, it's growing outwards into the lumen of the urinary bladder, and endophytic, or inward invasion uh, into the muscular tunics of the urinary bladder. Uh, and uh, these tumors readily get into the lymphatic system and metastasize. That's just a higher magnification of uh, the neoplastic process in the mucosa. Uh, black tumor cats, uh, they had uh, no real trends, although, <laughs> oddly, I have two black footed cats that have tumors involved in the tear glands or other glandular apparatus around the eyes. And I didn't have this in any of the other zoo cats. So I don't know if it's a true trend or just a coincidence. But we you know, don't generally see these types of tumors. And uh, they have two of them in this species would suggest the possibility of a trend in, uh, in, of that tumor in this species. We just don't have a lot of the cats. They're just not that common. And then uh, you know, we have all these miscellaneous small cats with very low numbers. Uh, and there were no tumor trends in any of these cats either. But again, we have very low numbers, so we're not sure about, uh, uh, about, the, uh, about the tumor trends in these animals. And that is it for the, for the feeling tumors. <laughs> now, I have uh, presentations uh, on uh, primate diseases and on uh, infectious and non-infectious diseases of reptiles. Those are longer presentations uh, that uh, will take more time than the, than the uh, zoo feelings. So uh, I, I suggest that we maybe take a break and then uh, come back and, and start with either the primates or the reptiles. It doesn't matter which one we start with. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, first off, are there any uh, questions regarding the cats? We do have some questions regarding the cats. Uh, Dr. Daniel. 